Hi there everyone, my name is Priyar Jirdhani. I'm an MD MBA student here at Yale and I make videos on medicine, productivity, business. And today I, I was actually never planning on posting a video, but um, this article came out and I thought it combined so many interesting facets of medicine um, that I actually think this video would be beneficial for everyone to listen to, pre-med, med students, uh, IMGs, anyone in and outside of the United States about why America has such few doctors. Um, the source for this video is actually this, uh, this article in The Atlantic by Derek Thompson. I thought it was very well written. Uh, I, I know this is a very convoluted, uh, polarizing topic, but today I'm going to just kind of break this article down, break down the argument. And obviously, um, most of the stuff I'm going to show you today is purely from the article. And I may add a little bit of my personal interpretation, which will show you a bit of my bias. But at the same time, most of this is just purely uh, data that I hope will also help you reach your own personal conclusions. Um, but as you can tell by the headline, just basic economics, there, have, there are fewer doctors in America. Uh, that leads to more expensive services. We have about 20% of GDP on healthcare. Um, and ultimately, you know that if you want to become a doctor in the States, it is about as hard as it gets. And so let's talk about that. There's three big reasons that we're going to talk about today. And um, I'll just go one by one through each one. The first one is the fact that America makes it really hard to be a doctor. So the fact that why there are so few doctors, the first part is just that the journey is really tough. Um, you can see that the article actually starts with this quote, which says, Elizabeth Erickson um, had to go through four years of pre-med classes. She then had to go to medical school, which took another four years. She then went to residency um, and then did a chief residency year and then finally joined faculty. So after 12 years of studying and $400,000 of debt, she was able to become a doctor. You can see that that in general just doesn't sound like something that most people would want to do. Uh, and just economically, you can see that by making the road um, you know, as challenging as it, as it is, which I, I do think it should be, right? It should be tough because you don't want someone operating on you who hasn't been trained. But you can see that is this um, really giving the dividends that we want? Is, is this really providing exceptional health care? Um, and that's where you really can get into this argument because other countries do a bit different approach in that and usually have the same outcomes, if not a bit better. So that's the first reason. Um, the second reason is, is basic supply and demand. So basically, starting in the late 20th century, medical groups asserted that America had an oversupply of physicians, and in response, medical schools restricted class sizes. And so from 1980 to 2005, uh, the U.S. added about 60 million people in population, but the amount of doctors stayed about the same. And you can see that in the um, Atlantic article, these two um, sub-articles were cited, and this is the first one is about the physician, physician surplus narrative. And the second one was the Balanced Budget Act of 1997. The physician surplus narrative is this aspect of exactly what they talked about, which was in 1980, uh, the Secretary of Department uh, of Health, Education, and Welfare basically said that um, they studied the U.S. physician workforce and they said that um, a rapid rise in uh, U.S. physicians had occurred over the previous decade and was a cause for concern. And so that's, that's why they said there's a surplus and we need to stop increasing the number of doctors. And they, they pretty much halted it. Similarly, the Balanced Budget Act of 1997 uh, basically said, and you can see right here, this paper examines the financial and organizational impact of the Balanced Budget Act. Um, but ultimately, it said that um, the act disproportionately affected U.S. teaching hospitals, leading to substantial budget reductions in many institutions and the threat of cuts in many major programs and services that teaching hospitals provide to communities. Um, for those of you who may not know the economics behind residents, the way the, fun the hospital gets funding to take on residents is actually usually through the government because the government uh, – gives the hospital a certain amount of money for every resident. And there's only a certain amount of money that it will give based on how many uh, residents it thinks it can adequately train, based on the patient size and whatever. So if the government isn't providing hospitals money, then the hospitals can't take on more residents. And if the hospitals can't take on more residents, you are essentially limiting the supply of outgoing physicians, right? Now let me just tell you the same story through pictures. Um, notice that 1980 to 2005 is this moratorium uh, that we kind of talked about, which was the about steady uh, number of doctors while the U.S. population increased about linearly. Um, and you can kind of just tell, right? Supply and demand ideally should intersect and you should have exact supply meeting exact demand. Um, that's kind of what this index is showing. Um, this is where they said, oh, we have too many doctors. So they kept the number of doctors the same. And you can see the moratorium ended here while, you know, obviously the demand is far greater than the supply, which has led to 
exactly what this subheading says, which is as a matter of basic economics, fewer doctors, less supply, higher demand, higher prices, right? Um, so that's the second reason, which was just the supply and demand aspect. The third reason is the one that we probably will spend the most time on in this video, and that's just time and opportunity costs. So the US has few doctors just because of the amount of time it takes to become a doctor, the opportunity cost behind that, and then ultimately just financially, um, if it takes longer time, I'm coming out with less money, is that really something I should be doing or should I do something else that may put me net, net speaking, ahead of where I would be? So you can see, this is again a quote from the article, the US is one of the only developed countries to force aspiring doctors to earn a four-year bach four bachelor's degree and then go to medical school for another four years. And I'll show you the graph that su supports this data afterwards. Um, I, I, this one is from my personal research and I've also published multiple videos on this in the past, but the AAMC actually said that the median debt of a US graduate uh, was about $200,000 in 2019. And 73% of students do graduate with debt. And while that's decreasing, those who do borrow tend to borrow larger amounts. Um, and so what does that mean? When someone actually graduates from medical school with $200,000 of debt, do you really think they're gonna try to take the job that pays more or pays less? Chances are they'll probably take the job that pays more, right? Even if um, it means you're gonna train for a longer amount of time, if I could get away with a salary of you know three, four hundred thousand dollars versus one hundred to two hundred thousand dollars, I might take that one. And so what that leads to is subspecialization. And that's why we have this specialization bias in the US, which you may know. Most people end up going super specialized because that actually reimburses more, that pays more, and, and obviously, you know, physicians may be more incentivized to do that if they have four hundred thousand dollars of debt. Now let's just look at the pictures that kind of substantiate this data. The first one is this aspect of post-secondary medical schooling. And notice that um, Canada and the US are the only places where you have four plus four years. On almost a lot of other uh, countries, you can see that this is actually a single degree, uh, usually six years, potentially five years plus one year. Uh, similarly, in other, and then other countries, you have a little bit of undergrad as well as some postgraduate study. All this to say, you know, we take more time, which is fine. That's not necessarily a bad thing because, you again, you want people to be trained. But has that come with better outcomes? Most of our healthcare results show no. You know, it, we don't necessarily perform better in terms of healthcare outcomes than other countries do, which says that this extra time that we may be spending um, may not be giving the, uh, the dividends that we're hoping to receive. The second point I made about U.S. having more specialists is absolutely uh, prevalent here. So the light red is the number of specialists per one to per 10,000 people and the number of uh, dark red is the number of general practitioners per 10,000 people. I can guarantee you that all of us likely have been to a primary care physician uh, but rarely have any of us ever been to a cardiologist, a neurosurgeon, um, a urologist because those are specialists and yet we have many more specialists per one to, per 10,000 people than GPs. And GPs are actually, as you'll see, one of the biggest reasons why I personally, my hypothesis is why we spend a lot more on healthcare because we don't have as many GPs, people don't get as much primary care. Because people don't get as much primary care, we can't stop issues before they arise. And because that happens, now you actually end up having to see a cardiologist when you get that heart attack or you end up having to see a nephrologist when you do have, um, you know, irreversible kidney damage, when in reality, if you had potentially had a PCP and you could have gotten that blood pressure checked 15, 20 years ahead of time and, and controlled it, you may not have had those issues, right? So you're, you're kind of um, forcing everything down the river a bit, which increases cost. So all of this to say, you can see that US has a lot more specialists, and that, bit, that comes back down to the price of uh, medical education here, the time of medical education here. Um, and so ultimately, the reason why uh, this article mentioned the US has such few physicians is just, it's really hard, honestly, and, and we need to solve this, and this article also lays out some solutions, and maybe I'll make a video about that in the future, but I thought this was really interesting in understanding the factors that leading to uh, such few physicians in the US. It's really hard, the supply and demand is just outrageous, which leads to higher prices, as well as the time and opportunity costs. I hope you all found this video helpful. I really loved reading this article. If, of course, you wanna read it, it's always linked in the description below. In the meantime, uh, please stay healthy. Uh, try to try to take take care of someone else and and yourself too if you can. All right. Thank you all for watching. I will see you in the next video. Peace.